As executive business leaders, you constantly face the necessity to change, to learn, to grow, and to reinvent yourselves. Today's celebrity guest shares her life of reinvention, creativity, entrepreneurism, and impact. Stay tuned to the whole show to also hear how you can take a little piece of our guest's artistry back home with you and also to your workplace. So who am I talking about? My special guest today is Daphne Maxwell-Reed. And Daphne Maxwell-Reed is best known for her role as Aunt Vivian on the popular TV sitcom, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, also featuring lead actor Will Smith. She also had guest starring roles in shows like WKRP in Cincinnati, where she first worked with her husband, Tim Reed, Hill Street Blues, and Simon and Simon. She first took a lead role on the acclaimed series, Frank's Place, opposite Tim Reed. More recently, Daphne Maxwell Reed co starred in the miniseries, Jacqueline and Jilly, which aired on the Urban Movie Channel. She also had a cameo role in Harriet, the epic biopic that tells the story of abolitionist and Underground Railroad chieftain Harriet Tubman. Prior to her acting career, Reed worked as a model. And when she attended the prestigious Northwestern University, she was the school's first African-American homecoming queen. She was also one of the first African-American women to make the cover of Glamour magazine. Reed's creative journey began as a child in Manhattan. She says, I grew up knowing that I could be anything I wanted to be, but I also learned the joy and responsibility of working. She now balances her acting gigs with her work as a photographic artist, clothing designer, and education activists, demonstrating that it's never too late to pursue new passions and find new opportunities. Ultimately, Reed's life is a testament to the power of learning, whether learning passion from her father, attending university, or teaching herself new careers. She extends that experience as a member of the board of Virginia State University, one of the nation's leading historically Black colleges and universities. Throughout her many activities and endeavors, Reed continues to be supported by her husband, Tim Reed, who himself is a television pioneer, as an actor, writer, director, and also producer. Daphne Maxwell Reed continues to thrive as a creative entrepreneur and artist, and to dazzle anyone who knows her with her bold spirit, grace, and work ethic. So in her words, she further says, you always have to contribute to owning your own power. You have to be in control of your essence. You decide how it is shared, where it is shared, and how you want to be remembered by each step that you take. Having self-confidence then gives you the power to make good choices. So it is my honor and my privilege to welcome to the show today, Daphne Maxwell Reed. Thank you so much, Daphne, for being here with us today. It is my pleasure and thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Yes, I'm so glad that you are here. We have so much to talk about and so many things in common in a lot of ways. So let me just jump right in. Okay, go ahead. All right. So my first question for you is this. You played the role of Aunt Vivian on the TV sitcom The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, also starring Will Smith. So what was it like to be on the show? And what are some of your favorite memories from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? It was an honor being on the show. I had seen it the first three years that it was on the air. And when they called me and asked me to come audition for it, I was thrilled because the cast just seemed wonderful and the writing was good and the storylines were great. 
So when I managed to get that job, which wasn't easy, <laughs> I was really thrilled to be embraced by such a warm, talented group of people. Oh, yeah. I love the fact that you said warm and talented. Certainly, it was my experience, the talent there, the fun. It was just a funny show. It was a, an opportunity to just get a little break from everyday life. It was nice to imagine being in Bel Air. You know, it was wonderful in that welcome respect. <laughs> yeah, welcome home. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned, yes, you came to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air show for the last three seasons. And so in doing that, you were replacing a prior Aunt Vivian. So let me ask you this. How did you show up with your own unique style and successfully create a new Aunt Vivian? I was not asked to replace. I was here uh-huh. to come join the cast as Aunt Vivian. And I could only come as me. I couldn't uh, do the things that she did. I, I couldn't be the person that she was. I had to go as me. And what they probably noticed was the chemistry that I had with James Avery, with whom I fell in love during the audition. I hadn't met him formally. And when I got to audition with him, we just clicked. And I just, he's just a wonderful, warm human being. And that warmth translated onto the screen. And they treated me with such respect when I got there because they knew of my former work and respected me as an actress. And they were just embracing, greeted me with dozens of red roses and open arms. So it was not a challenge to start that job. You know, I love what you said about you were not replacing anyone. You were invited to join the cast to bring yourself, bring who you are, bring your A game. And one of the things that really resonates with me, Daphne, about that comment is this. In business, many times leaders are coming in and they're taking over a job or a position that someone else has filled, and there's no need for them to recreate that person. They need to bring who they are, their unique contribution to that new role and that new position, because that's why you've been asked to join the the, the team, so to speak, right? <laughs> you know? That's right. If they wanted the other person to stay there, the person would be there, not you. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's such an important point. You also were talking about the chemistry, you know, between your partner. Now, that was your TV husband, right? That was my TV husband. I got to borrow him outside of TV every once in a while. His wife would lend it to, lend him to me when my husband couldn't join me at a function and I needed a pair. <laughs> so <laughs> he was my other husband and Barbara was very understanding. <laughs> and so was Tim. So was Tim, I hope. Yeah. Uh, we had a ball. We all used to travel together, the four of us. And we just enjoy each other's company. I still am in touch with his widow and very, very dear friend of mine. That is so phenomenal. It really speaks to the whole notion of the the cast, if you will, being a family. And you really get to know each other at a deep level and the relationships extend beyond what you're doing exactly on the screen. So that's phenomenal. You choose to. If and you choose. We to. all chose to because we really enjoyed each other's company. And yeah. I get to work with my my other folk every once in a while. We'll do a Comic Con together and I'll be there with my daughters. And it's really wonderful. We have been through marriages and babies being born and funerals and all sorts of things. So we really truly operate as a family. That's really wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. So let me ask you something about your husband, because you and your husband are both in the acting, TV, film business. And so as a dual career couple in the same career field, what has that been like and what's been the impact on your marriage? We started out uh, wanting to be partners. And that was the concession that I agreed to when we decided to pair up. And um, he asked me what I wanted in a relationship. And I said, I want to travel. So we traveled and we worked together as partners. And we have done many, many years together as partners. And things change as times change. 
there are times now when I don't want to be in a partnership with him. <laughs> we built a studio together in Petersburg and we ran that. And finally, when it was sold, we decided, okay, you pursue the, the way that you want to pursue your career and I'll do mine and we'll support each other that way. And that's what we've done. Oh, I love that because it just says you really don't have to be doing exactly the same thing, yet you can still be partners, you can still be supportive, and you both have high-powered careers and high-powered backgrounds, and that can work. I, I think when I think about it from a business perspective, there are dual career couples yeah. In business, they both may be uh, heads of businesses or senior executives in a business, and it's a busy life. And yet you're saying you have to talk to each other and negotiate how you're going to partner, how you're going to support each other. It's doable. It's doable. And we were blessed that our children were a little older and blending a family takes work. And we were able to do that. And there were challenges with that, but we had lots of great times. And we have created quite a cohesive family now, including exes. So it's all part of growing together, trusting each other, loving each other to be their best selves. Yeah, I love that. Loving each other to be your best selves. Phenomenal. That's, that's a great one. That's a keeper right there. <laughs> so. So Daphne, I know that you broke barriers when you became the first African-American homecoming queen at Northwestern University and also one of the first African-American women to appear on the cover of Glamour magazine. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you do it? How did you feel being this trailblazer? Well, the uh, Northwestern story is not pretty. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I came into Northwestern in 1966 in a class of... 36 black students in a population of about 5,000 people. So it was experimental, it was challenging. Um, I became the homecoming queen the next year. I had been modeling, so there were pictures of me uh, in magazines like Mademoiselle and little uh, teenage magazines like that. So I was kind of in school and working at the same time my roommates decided to throw my picture into the homecoming queen uh, lottery and I was selected to be on the court. And I was concerned because the guy I was dating, I had met my freshman year and we were getting married very soon, but he had graduated and was playing professional football and I was supposed to go see his first game the weekend of homecoming. So I was not anxious to be the homecoming queen, but I was on the court. So they had this runoff. They selected the queen from the five who were on the court. The day they selected the queen, I found out <laughs> the day before that I needed a white gown. They didn't tell me that. So I had to whip up a white gown Friday night for a ceremony uh, the next day. And I was standing there waiting to hear who was announced as queen and anxious to get on a plane to go to Pittsburgh to see my love. And the president called my name. I did not hear him call my name. I thought he called the name of the girl next to me. And I was waiting for her to react and she didn't. She kind of hit me and she said, that's you. And I was stunned. They were not only stunned, they were pretty teed off. Everybody was not happy that this little colored girl was the homecoming queen. Oh my. So they treated me very disrespectfully, um, which I didn't take personally because I could care less how they feel. Um, but in introducing me to the Alumni Association, I was the last to go out on stage. They introduced each court member and you hear this great applause backstage. And then they announced the next court member and big applause. They announced the queen and there was dead silence. Wow. And I said, okay, thank you. And I left. <laughs> I was going, what, what, I, I can't go now because I have to go to homecoming game tomorrow. 
So that next day was the football game and my roommates rallied around me and we sat in a section together and we celebrated among ourselves. And then I got the crowd, the uh, cup and the newspaper showed up and I was on the Amsterdam news, the cover of the jet magazine. I was in so many newspapers about being the first black, but it was all from my community. The yearbook that year did not even have the homecoming queen in it because uh, when I asked the editor, why not? So it's usually a three page spread. She said, well, it wasn't important this year. I said, I'll remember that. <laughs> and wow. I did remember it for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing, amazing story. And yet somehow you had the resilience and the intestinal fortitude to get through that. And you had your roommates too, who were part of your support group to get through it as well. It's interesting, you win and yet don't get all the accolades that go with that, all the respect that goes with that, and, and yet you're a winner anyway. But that played pretty poorly for them as well because uh, they asked for donations to Northwestern University. And I had told them when I left my senior year, you will never get a dime from me. <laughs> mm. And they didn't pay any attention to that. So 40 years went by before they invited me back to remember what had happened. And I said, okay, I'll bring my son who is born of the man that I didn't get to see that weekend. And uh, I showed him what the university was like. Okay. And so what, to what extent was there a healing of the rupture or did it remain a rupture? What happened? Uh, the new Black Alumni Association invited me back for a Hall of Fame award because I was probably on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Uh, <laughs> and I came back and um, they said, tell us about your time at Northwestern. And I did, and they didn't know that I was disrespected. And a call was made to the president of the university and a call was made to me to apologize. And then they invited me to be on the board and I started working with them and the Black Alumni Association. Well, now, okay, that's that's wonderful because all of that sacrifice, if you will, eventually people came around and said, we didn't do right. And <laughs> let us apologize. And I think that's important. They said we, they said they. they. <laughs> 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 because they probably said to themselves, we today wouldn't do that. We don't do that. <laughs> but back then, and, and you know what, still, to be able to hold out the olive branch and to admit that what was done back then was wrong, and I think that's an important point. We, are, we don't always do the right thing, and we can make good on it later, you know? Just yes. have some healing, you know? Yes. And it allows you to even inspire the next generation, you know, of students who are coming along instead of saying, okay, I'm going to keep an arm's length away from yeah. You know, and I was, I was very um, pleased to be invited to put my archives at Northwestern University. So you can hear all the stories of all the things that happened back in the 60s and 70s with the Black community at Northwestern Archives. So fantastic. That is phenomenal. And I think there's sort of a cautionary tale in here. It's like, pay attention to who you're disrespecting on the on the way up, because they may get way up there and you might wish you had treated them a little bit differently. Yes. Yeah. So Daphne, tell us a little bit more about your backstory in the sense of, I know you were a model, you were in all these other magazines and so on, even before you got to Northwestern. So how did you get interested in beauty? How did you get interested in acting? Was this always a passion? Did you imagine yourself having a TV career? What, what, was, what were you thinking way back when? <laughs> <laughs> as I'm writing my memoir as we speak. Oh, um, good. <laughs> no, I had no intention of being in the entertainment field. Um, I was born a happy child and kind of a leader. <laughs> I was always trying to be in charge of everything. So I've always had a confidence about myself that 
kind of geared me toward taking advantage of opportunities that have been presented to me. So I grew up a very stable, loved, <laughs> encouraged young woman who was aiming toward education. I was going to school to become a teacher. And when I got to the university and looked at the curriculum to become a teacher, it was of no interest to me. <laughs> I completely said, I, I don't want to do that. And I realized that I really wanted to flex my artistic instincts. And I had the opportunity to do that by changing my major to interior design and architecture. Mm -hmm. So as I was working outside of school and going to school and I got married my junior year to that football player, um, I was always busy being involved with everything. And I have a confidence that I guess from the very beginning, nothing phases me. When I arrived at Northwestern the first day when I was a freshman, I was getting ready to move into my dorm room and the, there was a girl standing at the door and I said, excuse me, I, I'm in this room. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not rooming with no niggas. And I looked at her and said, where are they? <laughs> I don't know what the hell she's talking about. <laughs> well, this poor girl needs an education. <laughs> and I got a room by myself and kept on moving. I said, I'm not taking that personally because she just doesn't know me. <laughs> That's all her problem is. She needs to open her mind and meet new people. Yeah. Um, so I, I never was discouraged by name calling or being the colored. I was the only black chick in most of my classes from the fourth grade on. So it was nothing new to me. I was exactly. not phased by it. Um, but I knew that I could do anything that I really wanted to do. If they would get out of my way and if they weren't going to get out of my way, I'd have to push them. That's just <laughs> how it was going to be. I was on a path to achieve whatever my heart desired. It wasn't entertainment. That was opportunities that came to me that I took advantage of. And I was gifted enough to stand up and be prepared for those opportunities. But it was happenstance. It was all happenstance. The modeling was happenstance. And I kept doing it till they didn't call me to smile anymore. And <laughs> And then I got discovered as an actress because I was doing television commercials, which just happened to happen. I was not out looking for that career. And I took advantage and I learned every time I had a job, I learned something new about whatever it was I was doing, what was going on behind the camera, what all the people were doing. It became an interest of mine. But I have to tell you, I was blessed. I have not been banging down doors and being rejected. I have been in the right place at the right time with the right attitude and I got the jobs. But I also had a life outside of show business. I love to sew. I love to take photographs. So I had a life that didn't depend on the next job I got on television. You know, I, I think you've said some things I just want to highlight and want to punctuate. One is that opportunity comes to those who are prepared. And so you're prepared. You don't know what door is going to open. You don't know what opportunity is going to come your way. However, you're ready to walk through it. And you mentioned attitude. I mean, so often people forget that having the right attitude, I think about business, I think about work, being able to be noticed and selected a lot of times is about attitude as well as talent, as well as preparation. And you also said that you were willing each place you went, each opportunity you had to learn, to learn something new. I think that those are just, just important life skills. And I would say you are still a teacher, and you are teaching through your craft, whether it be acting, whether it be art or whatever. So I'm going to shift and ask you a little bit about one of your artistic pieces, which is this. 
I know that one of your hobbies is photography and that this interest was passed down to you by your father. You've got five published books on doors that you photographed while traveling around the world. And I want to ask you, how did you get interested in photographing doors? I know there's a deeper meaning and story. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I did tell you that I majored in interior design and architecture. And what yes. I like about architecture are the details. Um, so my focus in my vision when I walk down a street is in the details. And when I travel internationally, I love the details of architecture that are culturally different from what I see here in America. So if I'm in Morocco, I would see a door, a window, um, a tile, I would see details. Now my husband travels with me and he takes photographs as well. He would take a picture of the whole house. I would take a picture of the door knocker. <laughs> so these are the way we see life, both of us. It's a very good example of how we see life. I believe that doors are a metaphor for life because they, they represent opportunity and adventure and curiosity and craftsmanship and passage. And there's so many things that I try to encourage anybody who's looking at my books or talking to me about them is to notice the details in your life because going from A to B is just going. What you want to do is notice the details in the journey. It's the journey that gives you the fullness of life. It's not the achievement of that goal, because then it's time to set another one. So it's the journey that I want people to pay attention to. I want them to learn how to open their eyes to dream and to look at the things around them that make their life rich and to celebrate those things. So I celebrate doors all over the world. I love the notion of doors as opportunities. And we have to think about very often in settings where we are, which door of opportunity is for us at the moment, which door to open. And I certainly think in a business context, people have many choices and, and it makes me think of like these game shows where it's, do you want door number one, two or three? Yeah. And, you know, you got to select, you know, and, and, and see what the journey is behind whatever that door is you walk through. So great. Thank you so much for saying that. Now, I also know that you've got a collection of note cards and calendars and this, these note cards and calendars also feature your photography and I saw that one of the things you like to photograph as flowers. And you can tell by looking at me, I'm a flower girl all the oh, way. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You yes. know, <laughs> so tell us about this. <laughs> but I love that flower. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, I just, I love flowers and I love the detail of flowers. I don't want to see, you know, bouquet. Yeah, bouquet is bouquet. But the flower itself, the pieces that make it up, all the little stamen and the way the color is on one leaf or one petal that's not like the color, it's just fascinating to me. And I like to share that fascination, just encouraging you to look again at details. So with these flowers, uh, where do you take photographs of flowers? Is it everywhere around the world? Are there certain kind of flowers do you gravitate towards? All no, right. I take a flower anywhere. I, one of the flowers on my calendar for next year is taken three blocks from my house. I was doing my walk around the neighborhood, just getting some fresh air. And I saw this beautiful, beautiful sunflower and it was framed by a gorgeous blue sky. And I said, oops, take out the camera because you've got to show people the, the contrast of that yellow and the blue. It was just dynamic. And I said, I got to capture this. So those are the kinds of things that catch my attention. I don't have a favorite flower, I don't think. Um, I like some more than others, but not a favorite. Most flowers will do for me, but also greenery. There are some leaves that really, really thrill me. I was in Costa Rica and saw some beautiful 
umbrella leaves, I guess they call them. They were huge green leaves that people use as umbrellas. And the veining in them was just so intricate. I, I get uh, carried away with details. Well, what I love about what you're saying too is that the beauty around us can be our daily inspiration. We may not have to travel far, can walk right down the street from your house and see the inspiration for today. So thank you for saying that because I think we have to remember that. Now, you are multi-talented. So not only are we talking about your photography and what you're creating from these beautiful photographs, you also have a cookbook that's called Grace, Soul, and Mother Wit. And I understand that this book is sort of semi-autobiographical in a way, it's sort of a memoir, and that there may be some special family recipes in it. So tell us about the cookbook. The cookbook is something that I've been, I guess, collating for the past 40 years. I had recipes from my mother that I loved, and I got them written down finally. And I all had collecting things on my computer. I just People that I worked with, we would have an event, and they would bring potluck and they would have some delicious things and I'd ask for the recipe. And I'd tell stories about who that person was to me, what the occasion was, or what this dish meant to me at that time mm -hmm. and how to recreate that. But my main impetus is probably the best word for the cookbook is to try to get people to realize that sitting down with a meal with people a meal that's created with love can inspire a group of people toward great things. I remember sitting down with my mom and dad and my brothers at the kitchen table and knowing how much my mother loved to prepare this food for us and just having the best conversations and having the support that one needs on a daily basis from your family just in that small amount of time, it couldn't have been more than a half hour, 45 minutes of sitting at a table and sharing love through food. You know, I think that that also applies to business. So often we forget that we could eat dinner together as, as business colleagues and so on and get to a deeper level of our greatness. That way, it doesn't always have to be a meeting around the, the boardroom table, so to speak. There's a different aspect of each person that can come out around the food that's shared with love. Yeah, absolutely. Now, intimacy about sitting down and eating with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And sharing the same tastes, the same aromas. It gives you a sense of camaraderie. Mm -hmm. So it would apply probably to business as well. Absolutely, especially the camaraderie part and being able to, to operate as a, a collaboration team, so to speak. Yeah, you said there's something shared with those aromas and so on. I love that. Now, we're recording this right around the time of Thanksgiving. So uh, give us a little hint. Uh, what, what, what great stuff are you whipping up for Thanksgiving? <laughs> well, I just had this conversation with my husband yesterday. <laughs> I said, this is COVID stuff here. Now, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? Because we usually <clears throat> invite somebody to join us for Thanksgiving. Either it's somebody who is not going to be able to go home, or it's somebody in the neighborhood who we love to bring into our lives to assist with whatever they need assisting, or it's some good friends who are in town. And with this COVID, we're going, are we doing this? And I said, I can have a Thanksgiving dinner, just the two of us. He says, no, nope, I want folks. <laughs> I said, okay, then I will cook the turkey and all the sides, which I love to do. I get up early on Thanksgiving morning and start chopping onions and celery. And I love preparing Thanksgiving dinner and all the sides. And every year I choose a different side from somewhere else. I'll go online and look for something interesting. And I remember one year, about three years ago, I found this Brussels sprout recipe that had a bourbon maple sauce and it was just fabulous. So I add that to my repertoire, but there's always sweet potato souffle and there's always dressing and stuffing and mashed potatoes. <laughs> 
All right. So we can see that your artistry shows up in food as well. So that's a good thing. So I, I'm going to add another piece. You also, Daphne, you also have a custom clothing line that's called Daphne Style. And your wearable art includes Chinese silk brocade jackets and also stylish protective face mask. And for those of you who are watching this, not just listening to it, I'm wearing my version of a Chinese silk jacket oh, beautiful, today. Beautiful. <laughs> Most of my jackets are silk brocade, so they're yes. really embroidered. And uh, I've got about 50 different fabrics to choose from. And I decided to do them as custom pieces because I'm not just going to sit down and sew all the time. <laughs> so I do them as art pieces. And I've got quite a few of my jackets running around the country. So, you know, what's, what's funny about that is uh, you don't know this about me, but when I travel and I travel to all kinds of places worldwide, instead of bringing back art that you put on the wall, I bring back a lot of different clothing from different cultures, different countries. It's my wearable art and I wear it. I wear it to work. I wear it all around in my life. So I think that that's a passion we both share is the wearable art, except in my case, I can't create any of it. I just have to procure it. <laughs> that's okay. I, when I travel, I usually buy fabric of that country so that I can create something in my style with that flavor. And that's a lot of fun as well, but I usually do that just for me. I love that. Phenomenal. Okay. So now Daphne, we've been talking about all of these wonderful things that you create. You've been creating this cookbook. You've got these five books of, of the doors from your photography and travel. You have note cards, calendars, wearable art, the silk brocade jackets. I know you have some linen swing coats, stylish mask, all this stuff. And we're fast approaching the holidays. So where can people get access to all of this beauty? How can they go to the right place, get gifts for family, friends, colleagues, employees, corporate gifts, whatever? I'm Tell us. <laughs> it's very easy. Just spell my name, just DaphneMaxwellReed.com. I have everything on a website. I also do my own website, so I'm a little techie too. <laughs> and uh, I sell out of my unit here. So I usually turn things around in one to two days and happy to mail it to you any way you'd like it mailed. Ooh, full service, full customer service. Have it your way. I love that. So DaphneMaxwellRead.com, and we'll also put that in the notes there for people if they don't know how to spell it, they can see it in, in writing and be able to go to the website. So that's really wonderful. Now, Daphne, I know that you are using your creativity in so many marvelous ways today, yet at the same time, you're still involved in acting and there's an upcoming Prince of Bel-Air reunion show. I want to hear about that. Tell us about that. What a blast. <laughs> we had a ball. Uh, Will Smith produced this himself through his Westbrook company, and it's for HBO Max. He gathered all of us in Los Angeles in September. We each got to stay in a separate hotel <laughs> so that we were not reunionizing before we got on set. And we followed all the COVID protocols. It was quite well done. And we all met on the set of the living room of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And it was a blast. We laughed, we cried, we danced, we had surprises. We had surprise guests. It was just a most incredible adventure. And I can't wow. wait to see it. <laughs> So when will we get to see it? Where, where should people go and when is it going to air? HBO Max. And I don't know. It'll be sometime, oh, in the next two weeks. Oh, so just okay. listen for an announcement. I think Will is going to make an announcement soon as to exactly when it is. But it'll be on HBO Max. So you can see it anytime after the initial launch. It'll be playing for a while on the platform. But it's, it's coming up real soon. 
I oh, really phenomenal. Do. I'm so glad to hear about that. I'll make sure that I catch it <laughs> for sure. And you also have another project, another film that's called The Business of Christmas. So tell us about that one. And I know that one's airing around December 1st on BET Plus, but tell us about it. We had the privilege of shooting that in Los Angeles and finishing three days before they shut Los Angeles down. But it's a lovely little story about um, a black couple who own a toy store and their kids are grown and have their own lives and they're supposed to be empty nesting, but they like to have the family around for Christmas. But the kids are all too busy to come home for Christmas and a challenge arises with the mortgage and then health problems ensue. So it's a family finally coming together under circumstances that maybe not all of them would like, but in the end, glad that they came together. And yes, they saved the day. (laughs) Well, that's actually appropriate for the times that we're in with the pandemic going on and business disruption and so many challenges. And yet there's value in still coming together in spite of. So that's a great inspiration for the times that we're in right now, Daphne. So again, for people to check that out, that's BET Plus on the 1st of December, the business of Christmas. So as we're wrapping things up, Daphne, at this point, as you know, my audience are business leaders. They're executives in business. And so you've said a lot of things so far as an artist, as as a business entrepreneur yourself. What additional words of wisdom would you like to leave for my executive business audience? Something that my husband told me years ago that I pass on whenever I get the opportunity and which I live by. And is don't let the successes go to your head and don't let the failures go to your heart. Ooh, that's profound. That's profound. All right. That's keeping some balance about who you are. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because so often we do let those failures go to the heart and they can stop us. They stop you dead and there's no reason to stop. A failure is just a lesson. It's just, okay, it doesn't work this way. Let's find the way it does work. Get up. You will be a failure if you don't get up. Amen. Yes, indeed. So these are life lessons and back to the teacher in you, teacher Daphne Maxwell. Reed is saying to us, learn from the lesson. Get back up. Stay humble on your journey. That's the message and the watchword today to all of you out there on the Voice of Leadership audience. And I want to thank you, Daphne Maxwell-Reed, for sharing your wisdom, your artistry, and your life experience with us today. My pleasure. Thank you again for the invitation. You're welcome, and you are welcome to come back at any time. So to my audience out there, see you next time, and thanks for joining us.